gamers, gals, non-binary pals. It's okay for me to leech off of this channel because I used to edit for it. We're going to be taking a look at Farfa's The Yu-Gi-Oh! Community is Furious and I'm pretty sure we all know what it's all about. Our favorite deck, Fire King slash Pure Snake Eye. Ooh, Normal Summon Ash, Special Dina Bellstar, Vikita, Princess, Among Us. All I'm going to say is that this format is actively miserable and I cannot wait until this deck gets slaughtered. So let's see what the Yu-Gi-Oh! Community or what Farfa calls the Yu-Gi-Oh! has to say about it. As a Canadian, Jesse is used to being ignored, and so he made Christ. it his mission to cement himself in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, fighting through some of the fiercest competition in the game, like the Human huh? Centipede, Penguins, a middle-class Brazilian armed with enough hand traps to negate a small military compound... Did Mr. Beast edit this fucking video? And perhaps oh the God. most difficult end boss of all time, a man from Ecuador. You what? too can enjoy Phantom watching? Nightmare format by simply purchasing three Fire King structure decks and committing Grand Theft Auto. I will die on this hill, but by playing only one copy of Diabell Star, Jesse technically won the UDS with a budget deck. To quote Gage's least budget unhinged deck. take, the best thing about this format is that you don't need to interact with poor people. Today we're going to be discussing <laughs> a little bit of what happened this Objectively week. true! Most notably, of course, for those of you sleeping under a rock, Mr. Bessie Botton himself won the UDS of the UDS of all UDSs to conquer the UDSs, the ultimate duelist series and invitational of the champions of the UDS. And uh, Pac managed to win another YCS at the 3 versus 3 in YCS Costa Rica. I want to take a look at this discussion all I'm gonna say is that it was so funny how me and a bunch of my friends, sometimes we would just like be awake super late at night because we're all fucking degen gamblers or, you know, insomniacs. And we would just like sometimes when an event was going on, we would watch it. We would talk in the group chat or whatever. It was so interesting how everyone was just so disinterested in the entire UDS. Because round one was Snake Eye. Round two was Snake Eye. Round three was Fire King Snake Eye, maybe. Round four, Snake Eye. Round five, Snake It was so fucking lame to just see... Fire 500 mirror matches and like one motherfucker playing like cash hero with shifter like that's what makes the format so lame to me is that not the fact that it's expensive in which case if you are poor simply make all your money gambling like i do but the fact that the only actual quote unquote real meta option to play within the format or whatever is exactly a 1500 dollar deck like that is 40 percent of the way there to an apple vision pro are you telling me that this deck that's gonna get banned in fucking three weeks and is gonna have its value fucking chopped in half is a great investment and about two and a half portions here let's talk a little bit about the concept of i love diversity zero, uh and whether or not that's good or not good because that's currently where we're at right now that's looking like what the current format is especially when you look at the deck breakdown uh in the region of upwards of 82 percent of top cuts uh, or attendance i suppose in the place of uds we're running some snake eye variant a little bit divided between fire king and pure fire king edging out ahead slightly edging? more than pure snake eyes but yeah it's uh it's a snake eye format if you don't like snakes on the plane well um this is gonna be a bit of a rough one for you now uh let's begin with my first uh sort of point five point preface here alpha patch note description disclaimer i suppose uh one of the uh points here is that regardless of whether or not you like teaser you dislike teaser you think it's a good thing a bad thing um the point is is that if you do want to participate in this current format at the level of which uh, the majority of the people are taking part in at least in terms of top cut representation you're going to be forking out roughly over four digits worth of currency. fun yeah you're looking at easily 1k plus for a full snake eye deck from uh everything that you need side deck main deck extra and uh well i'm gonna be honest with you as someone who is really passionate about this format and actually really wants to dump uh ha, dump uh are we editing that out probably not as someone who really wants to jump into this format and take part in these mirror matches and go through all the fun little you know puzzling and uh problem solving that exists in Yu-Gi-Oh, which is building your deck according to the meta trends etc etc uh i'm just i'm i'm priced out of this format i'm just maybe i'll open a p.o box and someone can give me a snake eye core i'm not gonna do that that would be scummy uh but hypothetically you, you know Scam that would be great be funny. i would love to play this format but i just i'm not going to because i can't afford it i don't know what to tell you but i just i i don't have the finances to be able to take part in playing snake eye mirror match i'm gonna have to borrow that and play 
uh, someone else's deck at locals for a few weeks to get caught up on things. Bait. I wonder how much Pax spent for his max rarity build. Max rarity Snake Eye, like Fire King, that is a deck that costs like four to five thousand dollars. That shit is not fucking cheap. Like, if you guys don't know, I own Labyrinth in max rarity, and that is already almost like two and a half to three thousand dollars. Imagine how much an actual fucking meta deck is. You know what I mean? He spent like five hundred dollars just for the princess qcr <laughs> well you probably should have waited because princess qcr is like 300 now 1.5 to two thousand dollars that is how much a deck quote unquote should cost to play in regards to like max rarity like if you're a fucking gambling dj like me or a rarity whore like pack yeah we're gonna fucking shell out our fucking billions of poker money in order to buy a snake eye core in fucking max rarity or a labyrinth deck in max rarity or like a suite of effect mailers and like qcr or whatever what should not be the case is for the average normal competitive player like farfa or whoever spending thousands of dollars every three to six months just in order to keep up with some sort of fucking arbitrary metagame that's just unfortunately not gonna last forever like let's be real nobody is gonna be like oh wow i can't wait to play snake eye format on dueling book like remember how everyone said that like oh my god tier limit mirrors are gonna be like the new format on dueling book oh it's so interactive spoiler alerts most modern formats kind of suck dick dude are you telling me that games two and three being decided by fucking summon limit and cross outs is fucking fun deck building it really just makes me not want to play the game exactly like what's the point for the average player to invest time energy and most importantly of all fucking money into learning a game trying to get better at it when they realize that just like you know there's a fucking slot machine and if konami has three sevens in a row bing bang bang ten thousand dollar format and like we see this happen like once every like one or two years where this year it was extremely egregious with like fire king snake eye like you guys saw earlier in this pie graph like look only 18 percent of all decks within the fucking top 16 room were anything not named snake eyes like it's not like 18 percent voices voice or 18 percent like flu on Rees, or 18 percent like cashier or whatever it is just a mix of 18 percent of anything that's not snake eye just imagine being a person trying to get into the game and someone's just like holding a gun to your head and says give me 1500 fucking dollars or you're gonna get your shit kicked in like that is just the reality of the format that we're in and it's just extremely frustrating for for almost anyone who doesn't have like obscene amounts of like disposable income like me a fucking degen gambler gamble your kidneys in order to afford this format of my observations and what i've been seeing um it seems to be a pretty fun mirror match for the most part although things might degenerate a little bit into some toxic unhealthy stuff that we usually see every single format <laughs> floodgates uh but that's a discussion floodgates. for a little bit later let's focus on a little bit on the concept of tier zero which is what we're looking at here today so point number one uh, most important of all is that this is going to be quite a frustrating time for a lot of players because whether or not you do like or dislike tier zero if you do want to participate in this format in any kind of competitive successful chance of doing well uh you're probably going to have to uh yeah, spend a lot of money or play Fluwander or Kashtira, I guess, if you're looking to be on a bit of a budget. I mean, Kashtira won Glasgow Regionals, so, you know, that I, I can't think of a better representation of the metagame than what happens Kashira. in Scotland specifically. Wow. So, in theory, over here, Kashtira is the best deck. So, you know, congratulations for all of you budget players. Although I don't even think Kashtira is that budget. Is, isn't Theosis still, like, expensive? Anyway, so Tier 0 can be Planet's positive uh, if some of these conditions are met. It's cheap enough to get into. And, of course, uh, if the mirror match is good. But, yeah, provided that, that number one, the meta is good and uh, it's cheap enough to get into tier zero can maybe sometimes be fine but um i suppose a different angle is uh well what about diverse formats now we just came out of a format where there was probably like actually just like 15 plus viable decks that could good like, at i any love that shit take ycs a bit much um generally from a viewership perspective at least and a um you know a watcher's experience uh it, it, that's good because you get a little bit of variety some diversity um, but from a competitive standpoint, uh, preparations and things like that can sometimes feel a little bit hard and rough to get into the game. Like, how do you, how do you tech out? How do you prepare uh, for a format in which there is like like 15 viable decks, right? Like that, that's obviously very difficult. I'm gonna say, if you are a person who actively complains that why can't I just play like the 100% most optimal build and beat every single fucking deck to ever exist, please play a different game. Yu-Gi-Oh just is not that. Yu-Gi-Oh should never be in a spot where a main, side, and extras, 40, 15, and 15, are just 100% cemented in stone as you have to play X card 
card because it beats X matchup. You have to play Y card because it beats Y matchup. That sort of deal where it's just perfectly rationalized and like your engine could just be 90% of the field and your side deck could take care of like the remaining 10%. Yu-Gi-Oh should just never be in a spot like that. And I think that people who advocate for formats that are not diverse and are extremely limited with like one or two top decks, uh, honestly, fucking dedicate your time to playing chess, bro. <laughs> like if you want to play a game literally based on fucking optimality and perfect information, just play, just play fucking chess, bro. <laughs> somewhere a little bit in the middle tends to be where the more enjoyable fun formats exist where you have like two three region of uh, number of viable decks in any one time and then whatever rogue options exist under that at perhaps a less representative uh, rate so that's kind of that first part out of the discussion here let's move on to the next part and that's talking about the specifics of snake eye well uh, over this last weekend we saw a pretty even uh, split between some of the, uh, the, the the builds there's there's pure and then there's fire king is pretty much what your answers are uh, I don't think I saw any Rescue Ace. Uh, I, it's probably doable. It's probably viable. I mean, anything with the fire attribute is probably viable right now if you stick in enough bonfires in a Snake Eye engine with a level 1. Uh, so probably that's going to be viable. But we did see predominantly Fire King um, and also the pure Snake Eye version. Utilizing uh, the next point that I want to bring up is the number of hand traps that people are playing. Perhaps it's something that people do in general because it's just the safest thing to do and it's the most uh, kind of comfortable sort of approach that a lot of players have to a brand new set, brand new wow. format is like, well, how do you start to tech in and uh, build for the current metagame? Hand traps are usually the safest thing. Just keeping it nice, good old faithful and simple with the activate Ash, stop your search, trade with an infinite impermanence, potentially try and flood out your opponent with a droll and Lockbird, although that's a card that I think isn't very good against Snake Eyes especially not the fire king one but yeah that's uh that's a card we've seen um definitely been played in a lot of main decks and uh that's usually been the approach jesse cotton for example played 15 hand traps 15 individual wow unique hand good traps. format Droll, ash valor N did he play valor he definitely played ash imperm Droll, nib um and then more on top of that plus three cross out and a copy of talents totaling 19 defensive cards in the main deck that is 19 cards that do absolutely nothing for your win condition and have no synergy with your deck but well i mean cool. i guess there's technically some synergy with a level one but anyway the, besides the point right like it's a very hand trap heavy format and kind of what most people decided to play this weekend which is i find to be a frustrating approach in generally any kind of meta because a lot of that can sometimes boil down to gambling and like you act gamba Ash or an, uh, wait or you probably ash keep gambling with the flamberge uh, but a lot of it can sometimes be down to like trading hand traps like Imperm into your opponent's summons and then just hoping that they haven't got the extender and praying that your two hand traps is enough to stop them and then you can play and not get counter hand trapped on your turn. Uh, I find that to be uh, probably not the best way to approach any kind of uh, mirror match and I feel like that's probably the most frustrating part of this format if it ends up being that way because it's very early days and we don't know. Spoiler alerts, it kind of ended up being that way. Hot take, but people that complain about high card prices are suddenly fine with them. They pull a random QC on a little night or something. Something, two things can be true at once, dude. Say, saying like, yeah, people can be happy that they win the lottery and still recognize the lottery as an overall scam. Like, of course people will feel that way. Like, I think that Yu-Gi-Oh is a fucking vastly overpriced card game, but I'm still gonna pop off whenever I pull, like, an ultimate rare, or pull, like, a, a QCR. Yeah, spoiler alert, the format ended up being this way, and certain tier 0 decks do kind of end up in this shitty, like, 50-50 gambling scenario, where sometimes if you imperm the Ash, it's enough to just make someone pass their turn, but then you still have to deal with the possibility that they probably bricked on, like, Ash plus 4 hand traps, and then you have to chew through those, and then your opponent can just, like, normal a hand trap, and then use Ash on the follow-up turn to, like, summon a Flamberge and a bunch of other dumbass bullshit like there's just so much wrong with Yu-Gi-Oh when it comes to high power combo formats because it really does feel you cannot play anything because anything else is so vastly outclassed by just these combo boards and what they make and what their follow-up is and just like a bunch of other garbage the way to look at it is there are pure snake eye versions of the deck which uh, shout outs to Juan Andrade for getting second place playing only nine hand traps in the main but focusing on the most important ones and opting to go for some more board breaking capabilities utilizing some pop Popular cards. I say popular cards. It's it's really interesting how long this card has been in the game. That's enemy controller. 20 cards Goated in the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame, am I right? In and out of the format. And here we are in today's day and age. We see Econ 
of all cards being uh, still played until now in a high power deck like Snake Eye. Also playing things like Chalice, which is interesting. Uh, I suppose Chalice. the idea behind Chalice is that I don't actually know what the difference between Chalice and Imperm are. Realistically, I suppose it's good to draw off of talents, unlike Imperm, which if you already have a board drawing, Imperm does essentially nothing. So I guess there's that. Um, and of course, uh, there was some people even playing Super Polymerization this past weekend, which is pretty neat. A card which uh, some people may or may not start to adjust their end boards uh, to beat, depending on uh, whether or not Super Poly is going to become popular or not. So this is Spoiler, kind of where Super we're Poly at turned the, out to be um, ass, and no one's playing that shit anymore. Of, like, do I go all in on hand traps? Do I play some board breakers? Do I play Fire King or do I play Pure? I like the Pure version more. I think it's a little bit more enjoyable, first and foremost, but also the added ability to play sort of uh, more defensive cards and kind of just more non-engine, but also trying to maintain some of that consistency with uh, just maintaining 40, I think, is the most important thing, which I don't think any of the top decks from the UDS actually did, which is a bit of a strange one, in my opinion, but at least in Pure, I think I definitely want to stick to 40 cards. And then having all of those defensives on top of that to back you up is really, really strong. I think one of the better things about the Snake Eye deck specifically is that it's very difficult to floodgate. There's not a lot of cards that actually hurt it really well, especially in the mirror match. You're not going to be playing Shifter in the mirror match. Um, and even Shifter sometimes might not do it. <laughs> we watched on stream uh, Shunping play against Fluander, get shiftered, get evenly matched, and still win. So, like, does Snake Eye have any weaknesses after all? I don't know. Like, that's kind of crazy, right? It's crazy how people will be like, oh, well, you could just play, like, Fluander Rees or Cashier or whatever. People were saying that during, like, tier limit format to just play, like, a shifter deck, like Exosister or Flu. And it just turns out, if a deck is good enough, it's, it can still play through or beat the cards that fucking beat your cards. You know what I mean? Like, Snake Eye could still technically build, like, some sort of board through a shifter like tier limit very much could play through shit like dweller or shifter because they have like the bestials it could sit on a fucking dweller or some shit like that i don't know it was fucking annoying pretty difficult to floodgate snake eye um and there isn't really any crazy blowout floodgates in the mirror match either other than potentially dweller if people start making that he did play parallel exceed which was a very neat card um and i guess anti-spell as well was in a lot of side decks which if you flip that going first can turn off a lot of cards but even then depending on your hand some hands can just play through and not actually utilize too many spells anyway this has just been a very very quick brief uh, surface level analysis of where we're at my thoughts on the current game my thoughts on the current meta and where we stand in terms of the tcg and uh, overall, I think I'm pretty excited, but also a little bit apprehensive to see which direction this takes. I think the Mirror Match and Snake Eyes uh, as a deck is really cool and fosters a lot of skill expression. And I think the best and top players will be able to uh, come up with some lines and combos we've probably never even seen before and uh, build in such a way that might be interesting. And hopefully uh, we'll start to see some things that aren't as you know, straightforward as here's a bunch of hand traps and here's some Snake Eye cards. We'll see how quickly this format gets to being solved. Uh, but overall, right now, um, this could uh, this has potential to be a pretty good format. But also, there's a world where this becomes completely doomed, and we end up with a super solved total tier zero format with no other. I, ways to I play think we're kind of deck. in that format. Uh, I'm not. Maybe lie. we'll see some voiceless voice uh, being a little bit better soon. But until then, you know. We'll see. Leave a comment down below with your thoughts on the current metagame and the format where you see this going and any uh, things you want to share in terms of the Snake Eye Mirror Match or the current metagame. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time. Adios. Overall, I share a ton of sentiment with Farfa. The price of the game, just how the game can feel very 50-50 in regards to how this game can just feel like you just have to open two to three hand traps and a starter to even stand a chance versus Snake Eye, Fire King. It's just, it, it's a terrible place to be in my opinion. I think that overall this format is just, it seems cool on paper, but in reality, it just feels like you're playing chess. You know what I mean? Like it's so solved, it's so optimized. And for some people, if you want to play this experience, extremely solved integral game i think that's really cool and good for you but i think that <laughs> no chess board should cost 1500 fucking dollars anyways let me know what your favorite chess opening is in the comment section down below and yeah it's gonna be it for me